more uh, the uh, hijinks from that uh, the, you know, uh, important investigative body. It was bipartisan, don't you know? I'm talking about the J6 Star Chamber, lorded over by Benny Thompson and facilitated with uh, Republican Quislings, Adam Kinzinger and Liz Cheney. Digital forensics team employed by the House Administration Subcommittee and Oversight discovered a data deletion that occurred on January 1st of 2023. Oh, interesting. Data deletion in terms of the information called together by the J6 committee that was to be turned over to the uh, new leadership in the House. They're trying to recover 117 encrypted files that the House Select J6 Committee deleted before Republicans took the majority last year. Morgan Griffith, Republican for, from Virginia, saying the reports are accurate. Unfortunately, we cannot determine what was in the deleted files. They're attempting to do that at present. No, you know, the purveyors of transparency, these uh, uh, patriotic fact finders, we're told, and we were witness to in prime time, you might recall, during that uh, Torquemada like performance of that committee. Yes, uh-huh. they, they you know, set aside the bachelor for this one night on a Thursday, yes. Why is this important? It's important, well, it's important on a number of levels, just in terms of the scams your government runs on you. That's number one. But uh, why is it important in this time, even though that has since been passed? Because that's the entire campaign of the Democrat Party, Democrat Socialists. That's, that was the Biden speech at Valley Forge. That was the Biden speech in Charleston. Then his... Uh, surrogates were dispatched to go on the talk shows to repeat what he read at Valley Forge in Charleston. It's the whole thing. Save our democracy versus MAGA dictatorship. And the J6 committee is supposed to be uh, the part of the evidentiary body that compels your support for Joe Biden, the American people's support for Joe Biden, to prevent this insurrectionist crowd from seizing control of the federal government and ending our representative republic. That's the line they're selling. For more on all this, we're pleased to be joined by Scott McKay. Scott, of course, is the publisher of The Hayride. He's also a contributor, contributing editor at American Spectator, an author of Racism, Revenge and Ruin, which uh, focuses on our very own native son, Barack Obama. Scott, thanks for joining us. As always, appreciate it. Dan, Amy, it's always a pleasure, and today is no exception. Uh, Today is a primary day in New Hampshire. How exciting. Uh, What do you anticipate will happen today and then uh, tomorrow in terms of whether or not this uh, Republican primary campaign uh, continues in a significant way or not? Well, there's a Suffolk poll out, and I guess it's a tracking poll, Um, and it has Trump at 60 and Haley at 38. Um, I think that might be a little high for Haley, except I know there's going to be a lot of Democrats who cross over and vote in that primary. Um, And that's going to, I think, inflate the amount of support that Haley has. I don't know what she's going to do, maybe mid-30s, I guess. Um, and that probably is enough to keep her going at least for a little while longer. But what I would expect is once we get into the closed primaries, which you start to see, uh, after South Carolina, uh, it's going to, it's going to be really patently obvious that Haley is not a factor of any great note within the Republican, uh, primaries and i think at that point the money will dry up and she'll have to get out you know she had 19 percent in iowa and she had to get democrat crossover votes to get that um and she spent more money in iowa than anybody else which should tell you something i don't think she has much of a constituency within the party i think her constituency is the mainstream media which is what mitt romney and john mccain's constituency was um, the difference is, is you actually have somebody who represents the rest of the party, which is two thirds, three quarters, four fifths of Republican voters. So, the, um, yeah. 
Oh, yeah. sorry, sorry for interrupting, but the South Carolina primary is about a month away, so you think she's going to last even if she loses, which she's going to come in second place, obviously, at a two-horse race. She'll stay in it until after South Carolina? I mean, she might not, but she's going to have the money to do that. So it wouldn't surprise me if she stuck around. And what you can really look for is a whole bunch of brand new, quote unquote, damaging revelations about Trump to kick in after New Hampshire, um, where they just kind of pour the kitchen sink out and see if that'll shake Republican voters off Trump, which it won't, because at this point, you know, I, I think that for the most part, the Republican electorate has an emotional bond with Trump by now. And like they're just not listening. And they probably shouldn't because the people that are going to make negative accusations against Trump burned through their credibility a long time ago, um, especially with Republican voters. And so, like, I just think this thing is baked into the cake. And the question is, will the donor class and the GOP establishment respect and accept the fact that the, the party's electorate has moved on from them. Uh, well, the um, uh, yeah, some moved on from some of them. But yeah, the um, the other thing that's happening concurrent, though, is and you've seen it in New Hampshire, especially is you just have like a parade of uh, Republican uh, office holders trekking up to New Hampshire to stand with Trump on the dais, I mean, including some candidates who have not gotten on the race, like Ramaswamy and Scott. And um, but it's just it's like this becomes a snowball rolling downhill where you have Republican Party regulars, those with titles uh, trekking up, like I said, to New Hampshire and 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 or, or otherwise announcing their endorsements of Trump. I mean, it's so that this whole thing seems, um, you know, the, the the idea that this race would continue in any meaningful way after today just seems difficult to conjure. Well, I don't disagree with you on that. And yet I'm looking at Washington and you have Republican senators trying to do an immigration, comprehensive immigration deal with yeah. Democrats. Yeah. And it's like, how out of touch could you possibly get? That's literally the only way that the Republicans can lose in 2024, and they're actively attempting to do it. Um, and so you can call that treason or sabotage or whatever you want to call it, but, like, these guys do what they do, and, and they're a little bit like Obama Democrats in that they don't give up. You know, they're different from Obama Democrats in that Obama Democrats find a way to win a lot, whereas Bush establishment Republicans find a way to lose constantly and yet keep, I, I can't even say keep fighting, they keep existing. Uh, well, what about Mike Johnson, since uh, he hails from uh, your general vicinity? Um, right. It, you know, I mean, it's one thing to dismiss what Lankford and those Quislings and Republicans in the Senate are doing. But Mike Johnson, you know, we understand the narrow majority he has and we understand he's got some big spenders in that caucus and he's got some weak knees in that caucus. But is he aggressive enough on this issue in saying essentially we're not doing anything? until you do HR2 or at least give us remain in Mexico. We're just, it is, it, everything is shut down until that happens. Yeah. That's what, that's what uh, the, where the party is. And that's not where he is. Well, I, I, you know, he is in probably the classic no win situation because he cannot get to 218 votes with aggressive enforcement. Um, they passed HR2, which would constitute aggressive enforcement and the Senate won't take it up. So he's in a, he's in this kind of shutdown politics scenario, um, which never benefits or favors the Republicans yeah, for the I, simple I, reason that he can't stay, he can't get his group to stand together. And so I like, I don't know where his room to move comes from now. Um, you know, he's had to do a CR because he's trying to get the budget to regular order, and he can't do that with the, the 2024 budget. He has to start it with the 25 budget because that's what he was left with by McCarthy. Um, and he keeps losing political capital with every CR he does, but he doesn't have another option. 
Um, and then you have this, you know, the Ukraine funding and the border and all this kind of stuff. And he's getting absolutely no help whatsoever from Mitch McConnell, which he has to have, because if the Republicans in the Senate sell out to Schumer, then Johnson's all alone with basically half of the House. Um, and he got, like his, his negotiating leverage is nil, so he can stand on principle and nothing happens, and the, the flow of migrants across the border just keeps on going. Um, so I, like, I, don't know, I don't know that there's any fix for any of this until after the 24 election, you know, if then. Well, Abbott should could, could take all the illegals that are coming into his state and send them to D.C., Delaware, or yes. the steps of the Supreme Court. You're like, okay, you That's wanted this. Exactly Here right. you go. No. What are you going to do no, now? I, no, it's Amy. not exactly right. No, no, it's not exactly right. What he should do is Mike Johnson should stand on principle, like you just said, and those migrants should be sent to uh, members of his caucus who are unwilling to go to the mat on this. That's what should be happening. You want? I mean, well, you could do that. That that's 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 I, where it belongs. Well, I had a I I Amy, I had an American Spectator column this morning that said exactly that. If you turn DC into a giant refugee camp and they're housing people uh in, you know, all of the the uh the, the clubs and and hotels and apartment buildings where members of Congress are, you might actually get a little bit of movement on this issue because generally speaking Washington simply is not listening on this and I think it's because they're more than happy to have regular Americans feel the pain of this so long as they don't. And until you find a way to make these people feel their own pain as a result of their policies, you're not going to get any solution to this at all. But we do know that, you know, sending migrants to Martha's Vineyard and Chicago and some of these other places, that actually does get people's attention. So I think they do need to go to Washington from now on. Put a big hey, white tent on the mall. Yeah, and they sent him to Kamala Harris's front steps, and that doesn't move the policy. You're not going to move the open borders crowd that you're because you're not their constituency, and they don't care. I mean, how, how much clearer yeah. could that be? But Republicans, what they do a terrible job at doing, and to per what's happening with the Senate right now, as you were just describing, and what frustrates people about Republicans, I'll speak for myself, I know it in a Republican Party that destroyed itself in my home state of Illinois, is policing themselves. You know, it's easy to do the whole Brandon Johnson and Pritzker and Eric Adams and Hochul and on down the line. Um, how about the enemies inside your perimeter? How about when you have the majority in the House, as the Republicans do, you say, look, this is a red line, to borrow a phrase, and this is what we have to do. And if it costs me the speakership because we've got big spenders and uh, open border sympathizers in the caucus, oh, well, then it does. But if we're ever going to stand on principle on something, this is the moment to do it. The other side couldn't be more upside down. The regular people in this country are finally focused on this because of what Abbott and to a lesser extent DeSantis have done. And so let's take advantage of it and let's demonstrate to the American people that there really is a choice and that it's not just a rhetorical one, that we're actually committed to this and we will go to the mat on this for them. That's what Trump would do if he was in office. I, I would I would love it if every member of that delegation would would take to heart what you just said, because maybe you could get somewhere. Um, but look, Mitch McConnell is the uh, caucus leader for the GOP in the Senate. And he's half dead. OK, and the guy has done nothing but engineer defeats for the party since 2007, and those people over there do not have the stones to make a move on him and get rid of him. I, I understand. And until you I have understand. that, I, like, I don't, I, I, everything that, that we're talking about here is, I don't want to say performative, but it's, 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 you know, you're talking about how good you are, but you can't make policy unless McConnell is pushed out and somebody with a little bit more of a, of a, um, Affinity for the GOP's position takes over in its place. And that's well, the problem right now is the Senate, I think. Well, I, I agree that's the problem in the Senate. But, yeah, I mean, look, if 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 80 percent of popular support 
for your position is not enough leverage to uh, wage war. Right. Then, I mean, I, then I don't know what is, you know? I know. I, like, and I, you know, right now, I don't know that there's a solution to this problem when you have these entrenched, uh, I, I wouldn't even say out of touch. It's not that a guy like a McConnell is out of touch. He's actively engaged in sabotaging his own voting base. Well, well, right. So, so send, I mean, this is my point. So, hey, Abbott, send migrants to uh, Oklahoma. Send them to Jim Lankford's office. Send them to his hometown. Send them to his neighborhood. That's my point. Yeah. Now, you, now well, you really get, now you're really cooking with fire. Uh, one busload of migrants that shows up in, uh, you know, on the street in front of Mitch McConnell's office in, uh, uh, I don't know where is his Lexington main or uh, wherever. office yeah, in right. Lexington. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, all of a sudden you're going to have certainly the whole state of Kentucky is going to is going to go into a media frenzy mode. Exactly. Um, and McConnell's got to say something from that. Problem is, uh, you know, you didn't elect a Republican governor over there. So you can't maximize it because what will happen is, you know, Andy Bashir is going to talk about how the Republicans don't care about the people of Kentucky and all this kind of stuff. And then it goes off in that direction. But I'd still do it. Sure, why not? It's one busload of migrants. It's a symbolic thing. And then send the rest to D.C. And drop them off at the, at the you know, whichever, uh, what is it, the Rayburn building that's the, where the Senate offices is? Drop them off there. Scott McKay, publisher of The Hayride, contributing editor, American Spectator, author of his new book, Racism, Revenge, and Ruin. Scott, thanks as always. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Have thanks. a good one. Thanks. You too. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. It's what Chicago is talking about. It's Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan and Amy on AM 560, The Answer. Hi, my name is Ryan Bourne. And I'm Danica Bourne. And, and we're, we're the, the owners, owners of South Coast, Coast Tax. Tax. We started our company 10 years ago in an effort to help our fellow Christians experiencing tax issues resolve their matters by taking a simple three-step approach. South Coast Tax are Christian-based tax accountants and attorneys that specialize in releasing bank levies, wage garnishments, and filing complex tax returns. We are the leaders in acceptance of offers and compromise with awesome results. We're also a small firm who will treat you like family, not just a number. Call us today at 1-800-TAX-1176 for a free consultation. And we'll take the time to explain all of the programs that you qualify for in order to allow you a fresh start. Proverbs 15.22 says, Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. Call us today at 1-800-TAX-1176, and together we can help achieve this goal by putting the IRS debt behind you for good. Again, that number is 1-800-TAX-1176. All right, you should always get a second, maybe even a third opinion when it comes to joint pain in your knees, your hip, your back, your elbows. Why? Well, you don't have to go under the knife. 